Okay, right. I'd like to say hello to everyone. Thank you for coming today to the latest in the Meet the Lindens talk. And I'm delighted that joining us today is Ebby Linden, CEO of Linden Lab. Well, hello. It's so nice to be here again. How are you doing, Safia? I think I'm doing good. How about you? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And we're joined on stage by Patch Linden who, like yesterday, is going to be handling the questions phase, question and answer phase of this talk. So if you have questions, can you pass them to Patch? Or if you can't reach Patch, can you try passing them to Dorney Davio? And she will pass them to Patch. So it's... I'm just typing her name in chat so you can all see it. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure that people have got lots of questions to ask you. I know I've got quite a few to start us off. Let's get to it. So, when you came to Linden Lab, you already had more than 25 years of experience um, of working for companies like Microsoft, and working on the office range of products. I understand. Yeah, yeah, I started my real career at Microsoft uh, in the late 80s. Um, and was there all the way through the 90s. Uh, yeah, 12 years. Wow. It was a phenomenal time and place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, before Windows, you know, back in the DOS days, and uh, <laughs> wow, joined the office team after a few years, a couple of years uh, before you know Microsoft Word 2.0 had even shipped. So yeah, and then I was there for Word 2.0, Word 6.0, Word 95, Word 97, Mac Office 98. So, yeah, lots of office and uh, extremely successful organization and team and product. So it was a really good place to have my start and, and sort of software career, uh, you know, getting off, get off the ground. Now, now you're originally from Sweden, but you've been in the States for a long time. Yeah, born and raised in Sweden. I'm still a Swede. Mm -hmm. I'm here uh, still uh, on a green card as long as they let me. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, I came here to go to college. I was a ski racer and had injured my back. So my big aspirations about the World Cup and all that and the national team kind of fell apart. So I sort of went plan B and went to college where I could ski and study and experience the world and landed at a really cool school in, in Vermont called Middlebury College, mm -hmm. where I studied fine art and uh, computer science. So I spent a lot of time in the art studio and the computer lab, so sort of extreme left brain, right brain type of uh, education. Mm. And, I'm surprised uh, you didn't end up at Adobe with that kind of input. Well, it could have happened, you know, but, you know, mm. I ended up, you know, I, I well, Adobe, I could have gone there too when I was in Seattle, but I, you know, mm -hmm. slipped in to Microsoft kind of on a random banana peel. You know, it wasn't <laughs> really a plan. It was just, I had to do something before they kicked me out of the country because my, you know, my visa was yeah. about to expire and got a job and, you know, now I'm here still. Now, you actually joined Second Life long, long before the possibility of becoming CEO was on the line. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with my current chairman of the board. We were actually uh, 
uh, good friends uh, back in college and have by by chance actually kind of shadowed each other. So he he spent some time living near me and with me actually for a while when I lived in Seattle and I lived with him a little bit when I moved to San Francisco and now we both live in a community fairly close to each other still and so um, we've known each other for a long time and so I got exposed to Second Life uh, quite early on by just talking to him because it was one of his early investments as a VC Mm-hmm. And uh, I got to know Philip and uh, uh, my son, who happens to work at the lab here um, for several years now, but he's actually working on the Sansar product right now. He um, had really successful uh, time in Second Life at a, a very young age, you know, creating content and starting mm-hmm. business and providing, you know, interesting um, experiences for for customers and uh, I just so I, I kind of fell in love with the with the idea and uh, understood what Philip and, and and second life was trying to achieve and uh, but it wasn't until many 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 years later well as of about just over five years ago that it came up that uh, they were looking for someone, and uh, it was the right time and place for for both the lab and me to to hook up and uh, see how I could help keep keep things going here. And uh, so I've have not regretted that decision for a second. It's been absolutely fantastic. It's an incredible group of people I get to work with. Uh, you know, having the Second Life team uh, mm. is just an absolute, you know, privilege and honor mm. to have this team. And, you know, many of you have interacted with or heard from or, or um, get exposed to people like Oz and Grumpity and Patch and Brett. And it's just such incredible human beings. You also got to see a little bit of April the other day. So... Mm-hmm. so Everybody is just, just incredibly passionate about the product, and so it's just an absolute joy to work with the team, and mm. uh, you know, trying to uh, not just trying, but also succeeding in making Second Life better and better. And uh, so that's just been just been a very very you know joyful ride for me so far. What would you say? Uh the aspects of the job that you love most? Um, probably diversity. Mm. Um, and I, it's diversity in, in multiple axes. It's diversity in um, people, mm-hmm. uh, diversity in uh, use cases. Kind of sounds boring, but the, the way people get value from Second Life is incredibly diverse. For some people, it's a a means of expression. For some, it's a business. For some, it's health. For some, it's education. And it's just that breadth and depth of of, um, ways that Second Life benefit people uh, makes every day kind of a fresh new day. It's not always the same thing. So Mm. it's the complexity um, which is, you know, sometimes challenging, but the complexity of the product because we're, you know, a platform with tools to, for people to create these worlds. We're social. There's an economy. There's, you know, all these different aspects. So there's always new and challenging and interesting topics that come up. It never feels old. Hmm. There's and there's so many still after you know an incredible 16 year run. There's still so many incredible opportunities for what we can go do. So the you know after having worked for <laughs> at, at you know the office team or you know especially Microsoft Word for so many years, you reach a point like what else can you do with a word processor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know you start going like yeah yeah okay. Been here, done that, but you know they just you just 
this is just a subject matter uh, that it's I just can't get tired of because it's mm -hmm. always interesting dynamics, whether there's social dynamics or technological challenges or economical challenges, just just like you always have to learn things and uh, discover new things and just constantly being like incredibly surprised with what people are able to do and yeah. achieve. Um, so it's it's just constant surprises and discoveries and learning and and that combined with the incredible team here and the passion mm. here at the lab just it's, it makes it a joy one of the things i want to talk to you about talk to you about is the economy because it's something we've discussed before and of course it's come up recently with the changes you've been making and I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, as you've noticed, um, any world, you know, it could be America, it could be Germany, it could be Second Life, there's always discussion about the economy. And it's always discussion mm -hmm. about what things should cost and who should be taxed for what and what types of things benefit what groups versus other groups because there's no one size fits all because of the diversity mm. of, of ways that people use or benefit or or depend on on a world like this uh but what i have been saying for it feels like many years now very consistently been saying is land in second life has been too expensive mm. and it's been a majority piece of our revenues and to remove our dependency of that being such a majority piece of our revenue, we have to find ways to move mm -hmm. uh, or, or shift our revenue model or business model from certain ways that we can make money to other ways that we can make money. And I've also been saying for a long time that you know, yeah, land has been too expensive. And so I feel we've been over monetizing land ownership. And we've been under monetizing a, an extremely vibrant economy within the world. And so simplistically, I kind of compare it or suggest it's like we've had really high property taxes mm -hmm. and almost a non existent consumption tax. Right. So how do we get this shift to happen? I mean, we also have subscriptions or premium. That's another revenue source for us. But so we're trying to shift away from land to other areas. And, you know, one of those is, is consumption. Mm -hmm. So as we lower land prices, we've been kind of at the same time bumping some fees associated with the the GDP or, or, or the economic uh, activity in the world. And we're meaning if you were purely a seller of goods in the world and didn't really own land, you actually have had a very, very low cost of operation on the platform. But if you were a landowner, you've had a very high cost. So well, I can understand as we make this shift, you have people that have benefited from very low fees on, on transactions, um, feeling that, you know, things are getting worse because they're getting charged more. And hmm. uh, people that have owned land will feel some relief because we've been moving it down, you know, in steps. And we've had to do this carefully over time because if you snap this change radically, you know, then you could destroy businesses, you could, uh, you know, take huge risks. And so we've tried mm -hmm. to figure out the right pace at which we do this rebalancing of the economy. And uh, as you noticed, uh, and as we you know communicated a while ago and kicked in gear, I think early this week uh, with these new fee structures, um, you know that was uh, an additional step in that direction of trying to create a more well balanced. Um, way for us to collect revenues and uh that's that's what's been going on and i you know i think it's still 
even after these last changes, I still think land is too expensive. And I still think that there's more opportunity for us to uh, monetize transactions uh, a bit more. I mean, even fully loaded when, when you sell something and you sell your lindens and you redeem your linden dollars, it's, you know, for, for, for real money. Uh, it's it's that's still not a huge number compared to what I would say uh, industry standards are for fees associated with digital uh, transactions. So that's that's the process that's been underway, and I understand that it, it makes some people unhappy, especially if you've been working, you know, low margin and you know margin changes. And mm. we'll see. I'm sure the people and the economy will adjust. People might raise some prices on goods they sell to kind of make up the difference, but you know it's also a bit of capitalism in here. You know, some people know how to succeed, and some will have a tougher time because of the content you create or the service you provide or whatever it might be. And so, uh, it might be a little bit tougher for for some, but um, we feel it's absolutely crucial to make these adjustments because we we found out from research years ago that like the number one reason uh, people uh, left was was the cost of land. Mm. And you can kind of understand that, you know, full region is, you know, used to, when I first started here, it was 295 bucks a month full retail. And uh, that's that's kind of a, that's a significant hobby. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to, you know, make that money back. And so... Yeah. And we've also, because of that, seen a lot of fascinating, absolutely beautiful and stunning content disappear because, you know, it was too expensive for people to mm. have it on, on uh, in Second Life. So that's, that's kind of the high-level view from me on what's going on. There has um, been a petition, of course, about this. Um, yeah, yeah. I read that. I saw that, and I understand that. Anytime you make uh, changes like this, some mm. group are going to feel um, that it's it's negative for them or, mm. or works against them, mm -hmm. uh, which is no different from new regulations or laws or taxes or fees or whatever that mm. happens in in the real world. You know, if you live in California right now, you go, "Dang it! I used to be able to." <laughs> deduct more on my state income tax than against my federal taxes than before because you know someone sitting somewhere made some decision but um that's that's how it goes and so i can understand that it uh frustrated some people um mm. but i also don't think we can uh, have some sort of democratic process with all the stakeholders on a constant basis to make a decision that ultimately makes everybody happy that's just that's just not possible it, um, it could cause and, and, and we do spend a huge amount of time interacting with the community and listening to feedback mm. gathering feedback whether it's in forums and you know uh, in product uh, meetups and jira and like there's so many ways that we constantly listen and understand uh, the needs of of people, but still, when we make the right decisions, it still will be perceived as negative to someone somewhere for some reason, and it's just mm. just a part of part of business. And so that's how it is. There is something that I was thinking of, which is. Would it be possible to kind of give more preparation time to people or would that just not work? You know, like, say, 30 days before a change comes in. Well, I thought we – I forget exactly how far in advance we communicated uh, these pricing changes. or, or And, you know, there was even time for some people to bring up some, some fantastic feedback and we listened to all of it. And mm. it even made us react to some of the changes we proposed and – we, we changed some of the changes we had proposed. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to find sort of a – we also want to move quickly, right? We, we, we mm -hmm. can't have, you know, month-long 
public debate. So Consultancy. We want to do, then we, it yeah. turns into molasses. Mm. And if anything, we're trying to figure out how to go faster, not slower mm. in general. How often can we ship improvements? How much often can we do changes? Um, and it's, you know, having a such a diverse uh, set of uses and customers and it, it makes it difficult uh, and always trying to make sure that we don't break things so that things you've relied on and purchased and used for years suddenly mm. doesn't stop working. And so there's a lot of friction in constantly improving something like this, but it's critical for us to do that because we all want it to get better, uh, faster, sooner. Mm. Uh, and so we have to find that balance between overanalyzing and over uh, sort of getting everybody's buy-in, you know, that type of democratic mm. process can you grind to a complete halt as you see in some real governments around the world as we speak. So <laughs> we have to... <laughs> so you know, point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, you know, we, we do make sure that we, we stay uh, fair and that we do what's legally required uh, mm. with regards to communicating changes that impacts people's businesses and lives. So um, mm. we, uh, we actually spend a lot of time making sure that we, we give people a fair understanding of what, what's about to happen when it's uh, of, of significant magnitude. So, hmm. yep. And you did, of course, row back on the group's changes. Yeah, that was one thing. Um, uh, that's one thing we had to we, – we learned some things. There were some ways that people uh, – found value in the groups that, you know, I think we came to recognize was maybe an angle we hadn't looked at it exactly that way. And so mm. that, that, that was um, something we just said, you know what, let's, let's not make that change. Mm. And because uh, we, we, we learned some things in the process. And um, so, you know, as you see, we, we do listen and, and we, we did give, you know, I think it was like 30 days or uh, heads up on these changes. So there was, you know, that's that's a mm. month. That's one twelfth of a year. Um, you know, and when you want to run fast, you, you know, I don't know how much more time than that we can sort of delay things to get things done. Mm. So you're saying about um, following the roadmap on the economic changes that you've been doing. Um, these people can feel very proprietorial about Second Life and very passionate. You, you've got various methods of feedback. Is it worth kind of trying to find a way that is less scattergun, that, that might be a better funnel? For getting responses, I don't know. Um, okay. Well, if if <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not. I mean, we'll, we'll obviously we're obviously we're happy to listen to any ways in which we can improve the gathering of information and get feedback and mm -hmm. communicate. But there's so many. First of all, there's so many more of you than there are of us. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. we're, we're a handful of people that can be involved in this type of communication and, uh, uh, you know, feedback process. Right. Um, there's, you know, mm -hmm. even though there's like 100 people here working on Second Life, there's only so many that can uh, go out, you know, primarily so sort of product managers um, mm -hmm. and customer service that that interact a lot with with users and listen to feedback and spend time on forums and spend every minute we spend time talking to people which are very valuable we're also not at the same time doing a lot of other things right so we have to find mm -hmm. a balance between how much time we can talk to the world about everything we're trying to do and uh, and spending the time actually doing it mm -hmm. uh, so um, and we, we already spend a large amount of time. And because our, 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 the Lindens here spend a huge amount of time in the product themselves, right? Right. 
we, it's not like we just have people who work on this product and ship it and go home. Like, no, we, we, we have an extremely passionate group of people that spend personal time and work time. We use the product all the time. You know, we have our meetings in Second Life. Mm-hmm. We, we use it all the time, and we have various meetups around a bunch of topics. If you want to get involved, go, go look at, you know, I don't know if I can top my head, just tell you exactly where to go. But there are wikis where you can go find the Linden Lab official user groups. So if you want to participate in those users group, you know, show up and, and, and get heard. Mm-hmm. There you can log issues on, on JIRA. Uh, there's, um, you know, the forums that we read and participate in all the time. So there's, you know, and just meeting people and talking to people like continuously, uh, and participating as, as residents ourselves. Um, I think we're actually very, 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 very in tune with what's going on and Mm. how people think about things. That still, even if that leads to the perfect decision and the perfect process for making a decision, will still upset somebody. <laughs> so it's just, you know, you, you can't just get 100% thumbs up on everything. You know, it's just a way right. you have to get used to. So um, so I'm, I'm very happy with how the team listens and participates and uses mm-hmm. Uh, Second Life and the Second Life uh, residents to, you know, make the best decisions possible for for our users and for our mm-hmm. business. And ultimately, those are the same thing. We can only be successful if you're all successful. And if you're all successful, we'll be successful. So we're, we're in this together. And so um, participate, get heard, and uh, trust me, we're listening. And uh, we're, we're taking all the feedback we get into account as we make decisions. I have to say it has been a tremendous change under your leadership. Um, in previous, under previous administrators, the sighting of a linden was kind of, you know, you saw more unicorns than lindens. Yeah. You saw more unicorns and lindens, more unicorns in the real world. Than <laughs> well, it had taken some unfortunate turns. Um, I can't speak to any of that, but uh, mm. my philosophy is, is transparency and interaction and communication. And, you know, mm. and so we changed some basic strange rules that were in place here, um, you know, almost five years ago now to make it obvious that uh, Lindens can participate in the world and engage with users in the world and communicate and, and listen and, you know, uh, be, mm-hmm. be involved at, at every level uh, up and down the organization. And that's been, I think, positive for both residents and Lindens alike because it was not fun for Lindens to not be able mm-hmm. to just be part of, of the world as they wanted to. Um, mm. I'm sure many of them, you know, had alts and, you know, did what they wanted to do anyway. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, but to be able to do it in an official capacity um, and uh, is uh, has been very, very healthy for us as well. So mm. um, those were fairly basic, simple things to uh, put in place. And uh, so glad that's that's being noticed i i've got a couple more things that i want to talk to you about uh and patch might want to jump in on one of them and then i'm going to start queuing up patch to take out questions uh from the residents who who, no doubt patch have they been sending you questions She's awfully silent. <laughs> no, I've gotten a ton of questions. So okay, great. A couple of things. One is a, a sort of think point rather than necessarily a question, but it's something that someone brought up to me today, um, and it's something we've we've actually done a designing world show on. And I wondered if the lab have any thoughts about it. And that's <clears throat> how sometimes 
creators in Second Life um, can pass, sometimes very unexpectedly. And sometimes their departures can be more planned, but sometimes they happen suddenly and they're quite unexplained. And I wondered if the lab had ever thought about formulating suggestions for what residents can do. Um, it's a fairly gloomy topic, but uh, yeah, I it's know also that, potentially yeah, very, it's also potentially a very private topic. You know, yeah. what what do some people? You know, how, how do we? Make assumptions on what what their preference would be. If mm, yeah, uh, so um, moment, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say at the moment. Um, I, I mean, it might help encouraging people to make kind of virtual wills as to what they want to happen. And suggestions. I, I'm just thinking about this because, you know, it's an issue that has come up several times. And it can be, uh, we see content pass from the world um, without kind of explanation. Yeah, and, and, and Patch's team does a, a great job when, when we hear about someone who cannot continue to support. Um, the worlds they've made, you know, what is, is there a way to transition those ownership of, of those? Um, you know, sometimes we've even taken them on to keep them up at our dime mm -hmm. to, because people wouldn't want to see them go away. And that's, that's, you know, content and experiences, you know, you mm -hmm. see some communities doing, you know, wonderful things when, when, when they've lost friends someone passed or something like that. Mm. I don't know if Linden Lab really can be in the business of um, sorting out a way for all of these coming, uh, these, 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 these goings of whether it's content or people uh, in some more, in some sort of, in a helpful way. Um, mm. I mean, there's so many communities in so many languages, you know, it would be mm. <laughs> really hard for us to keep track of and be involved in that kind of um, social uh, changes and impact that occurs. Um, mm. I mean, just for us to just keep this thing running and uh, keep it safe and keep improving it and giving support to all their technical issues or, or, or mm. whatever is, is have our hands absolutely stuffed to the brim with, with work to do every day. So I'm not sure we can take on a more social um, responsibility with regards to that, but again, mm. open to uh, suggestions if we can be helpful in some way. Uh, but I do see a lot of people and communities doing fantastic things for each other to support each other. And mm. you know, I think we, if we can create an environment where people take care of each other and support each other as, as we see you all doing for each other, then we've, I think we've done a, a lot to enable that to happen. Uh, but again, Happy to hear yeah. if someone has some suggestion for how we could be more actively involved in, in in those kinds of changes you're talking about. I can't think of anything on top of my head that would be mm. uh, efficient use of our time or uh, help solve the problem in a, in a meaningful way. The other question that I've been asked about is people who are living in private estate communities are slightly concerned. Well, I, 
this is Second Life, some of them are very concerned. Um, but they're, they're concerned that the popularity of the new Linden communities that are springing up in the, around the new Linden home might impact on uh, their communities. The people I've heard talking about this have been in, for example, the steampunk communities. And which are very strong. Yeah, so yeah, I think you're talking about, you know, are we competing with our own creator, with, with the creators in the community I, or the community yeah. organizers by creating our own sort of Linden operated world as opposed to just being a pure platform company and just leave all of that to to the creators. Um I mean I I think it's a good thing for us to be involved in for, for several reasons. One, we really need to not just build a platform, but also use the platform. So you know, mm. people call that eating our own dog food. Um, so having teams here under Patch who build content and social communities and experiences teaches us a lot about how we can improve the product, not just for ourselves, but for everybody else to be able to build better experiences, better content over time. It also uh, sets some examples for what's possible when you, you know, do a you know, significant investment that, that the team and, you know, Patch and his team has done to create this kind of experiences. And, the positive feedback we've gotten from this has been absolutely incredible. Mm. So maybe that have, helps lift lift the bar a little bit for what what does it take to create uh, an, an amazing community experience. And uh, so mm. maybe we help you know push it a little bit further in in what the expectations are or what what is possible. Um, there's also um, you know, we, we also have to think a lot about how easy we can make it for an, an inexperienced users to get involved in Second mm -hmm. Life. And Second Life is not an easy product for someone straight off the street to understand and how to make it work for you. You have to put some effort into Second Life becoming valuable. It's not one of those, you know, you hop in and you click a button and poof, it mm -hmm. all just happens you, you have to invest your own time to understand how to make it work for you and be valuable to you and so it's important also for us to lower that bar of how much you have to understand to get engaged with the product and, and become a retained user over time then maybe you find that okay I could easily slip into you know patches linen home but then maybe after you've been here for six months, nine months, two years, whatever you go, but well, look at that steampunk place. That is actually something that I find fascinating. I'll move over there. But mm. I think we have to take sort of a responsibility in sort of the whole onboarding and ease of use of new users. And we have to do that at massive scale. It doesn't help us if we make that something convenient for 12 people per day. It, we, we need to get this to be in the thousands and ultimately millions to, to grow and scale the whole uh, world of, of Second Life. So to do that at massive scale where the incredible work that, you know, Brett and Darcy and the Grumpy and team are doing to bring new users to Second Life, to help them understand Second Life, to get them to retain for a longer period of time and to be engaged with the product, we, we have to solve that problem because that funnel is, is, mm. is a critical thing for us to continuously optimize. So we have to take, we, can, we would not get the same retention numbers and engagement numbers if we just sent people to uh, all the creator made stuff. We, we have mm. to take responsibility for that funnel and, uh, but at the end of the day, we will be in aggregate making a, a, a minuscule portion of all the content in this world. And uh, uh, because there's so many more of you than there are of us, 
Mm-hmm. So I uh, hopefully people don't perceive it as competitive, uh, but instead perceive it as us doing our job, the best job possible to bring as many new users into the world as possible. And then every other creator will ultimately benefit from that because they can now sell more shirts and they can create more communities that are more, uh, uh, more, be be more interesting to our users because we can't create steampunk and 1920s Berlin and this flavor and that flavor like it's just it it takes it's just impossible for us and so to get all that variety of experiences and styles and cultures and languages and it's we we can't do it all we 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 will do you know a sort of a basic but hopefully high performing high converting high retention core and then the the rest of the world will benefit from that rather than seeing it as something that is is a, somehow a negative so that's that's how i look at it i i was actually interested by that um you're talking about the funnel and things, and yet the new Linden. <laughs> Sorry, my cough is a bit bad. You're talking about new Linden homes, but of course they're only for premium members, and those are people who are really already very committed to Second Life. I was wondering if you could have something. Patch is probably going to tear his hair out in great chunks at this but I was wondering if you could have something like um, a program where new users could have Linden Homes for 30 days and then at the end of the 30 days they basically get kicked out unless they take out a premium membership at which point they could move to another they could move to a community they could buy mainland no, they can't buy mainland. They could buy a pri- They could rent on a private region. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, but I, I, yep. but they yeah, or they could take premium and stay in their Linden home. Yeah, I I think that that all makes sense to me. I agree completely, and I know the team is thinking about uh, those kinds of things. You know, how do you get someone to, you know, get call it a trial starter kit? Uh, mm. And how can we ultimately make it easy for people to discover where could I go beyond that trial? You know, whether it's a Linden mm. home or steampunk this or basically that or whatever, mm. that there's possibilities for them to go where they can sample and try different communities and ultimately, hopefully, find you know their 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 preferred place to be and live for for the next period of time. Mm-hmm. And find their community and find you know their home, um, just like um, uh, so. Uh, so the, yeah, there's thoughts being discussed around that, and uh, mm-hmm. we're constantly testing new experiences. And uh, is it giving people something to do? Is it giving someone a place to live? Because that's not even necessarily true that everybody's looking for a home to rent and live in. That is a subset of the users that that's something that is attractive to them. For other people, it's playing games. For other people, mm-hmm. it's listening to music. For other people, it's performing. It's 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 a huge variety. So um, it's not sort of one size fits all here, mm-hmm. uh, and it's not necessarily an expectation that 100% of our users are going to have a home. Uh, that's that's you know one piece of what is interesting to some people. Um, mm. So you don't necessarily want to have a funnel where the entire purpose for everybody is to go get yourself a home. That would be uh, counter to wishes or needs of of other segments of users. So we have to find that balance of how do we find out what you want, what are you looking for, and how do we get you to what you're looking for as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, that's that's the complexity of this this world we have mm. here. That there's there's so many options, and I've kind of likened it to a little bit like we kind of <laughs> drop you off at the airport and then say, 
good luck. <laughs> you know, figure out what you want in life, right? And you have to have your own motivation to spend the energy and time to go discover what, what is relevant to you. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do because people that are new to Second Life have no idea what to expect, what exists here. Why would I even assume that there are these types of communities or these types of activities or this kind of content or that kind of whatever, right? It's how, why would I assume that that exists at all? So it's not like I can start searching for it like in Google because we all have grown up in the physical world with a lot of, you know, knowledge about what's out there. And, you know, it's basically a lookup for you to go get what you want. Uh, mm. Whereas in this virtual world that people get sent into, like the first three things they see or one thing they see, that's maybe that's their entire assumption of what the entire thing is. And so giving people these, you know, and you can't blast them with, like, here's a hundred options for you. Oh my God, mm. people don't want choices like that. So finding mm. that simple onboarding, but also gives them a clue that there's way more out there if you just... Mm. If you just go look, it's kind of an interesting balancing act, and we're constantly testing and trying to figure out the best path uh, to lead users through. And it's not just one path. You can mm. have different messaging up front for certain different types of segments of users, and you set the expectations for them, and then you try to take them down a path where you deliver on that expectation, where they feel that the thing they wanted to go get, they actually do get. So it's not, again, one size fits all as far as how to drive new users into Second Life and get them to understand and stick around. So, so it's a complex puzzle, and the team is constantly iterating and trying different messages, different paths, different experiences, um, and see which ones perform well, and constantly measure and mm. test, A-B test, for what works better, this message, this experience, you know, and uh, we we do all, most of it. And there's also community gateways and other ways for the community uh, and residents to try their own flavors mm -hmm. um, beyond what we're capable of, because we can't message every subject matter to every potential user and match every part of Second Life with some user that's just too big of a puzzle. So we have to figure out on some sort of the sweet spot and uh, hopefully with a lot of help from you all, you will find niches and special ways of bringing in users that we can't get to in the long tail of things. So, um, yeah. I'm going to throw it over to some resident questions now. So, Pat. Yes. Ready? Mm -hmm. I got a I got a good handful of them here. Uh, first one um, from. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, Ebby, how long can you stay? I don't know. How much energy do you guys have? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> we, we we got some time. I think. <laughs> I, I, Care, we, we careful now. I was here for almost three, three, three hours after on Monday. Yeah, no, we're, we're not going to go three hours. I'll, I'll take a peek at my calendar and see if I have a hard stop. Somewhere. All right. Uh, so first question uh, I've got here from Callie Klein. Um, she was wondering why uh, we didn't get much more notice on the cash out rates changing. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to plan and uh, stuff with your business. Um, you know, it also kind of picks at the confidence when a pretty big change like that uh, is made so suddenly um you know she she yeah. wants to know what she can do to keep her confidence up you know when things like this happen in the future well so first of all like i said earlier to uh, uh, today that i've been saying that we're going to be doing these kinds of changes for years this ex this very specific change we just made we communicated 30 days in advance so i don't know that you know, we could do a whole lot more than that. Um, it, like I spoke to earlier, at some point it just becomes mm -hmm. a, a massive amount of friction for us to be able to move forward and make changes that we know we have to do for this. Business. We know what we have to do 
and we're just then trying to make sure we do it in the smartest way possible. Uh, but there are certain things we just have to do. And so right. sometimes it's not really up for debate uh, as to whether we can or should do this. And so we want to give people, you know, uh, a fair amount of time to decide whether that's something that will work for them at all. So whether they therefore decide that this is not a business that's going to be sustainable for them, they, they get a heads up that they can now change tracks uh, or uh, are there things they have to do uh, within Second Life, whether it's changing their business model or their pricing to, uh, you know, to absorb the changes that are happening, to make sure that they still have the margins or, or a business model that works for them. So I think 30 days is about right uh, for something like this. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's basically, a, you know, 10% of the year right there, pretty much, when you take vacations out <laughs> and everything else that's going on. So, um, and, uh, so uh, okay. 30 days for these types of pricing changes, I think, is, is a fair. But I think then also in between, we need to keep iterating what, what our long-term goals are and so that people can be sort of prepared for what may come, even we don't know yet the specifics. But pricing changes, lower property taxes, higher consumption taxes, if you want to describe it that way, I think it's a very rough, inappropriate, you know, it's not, it's, it's not necessarily the correct way to describe it, but it's something we've been talking about for years, so this should not have been a surprise to anybody. Yeah. A um, little bit of a follow-on question that's pretty interesting, too, from her uh, was, you know, if, you know, creators, large creators and stuff were to come up with ways to... Uh, grow Second Life. Um, you know, do you potentially see an opportunity for some sort of incentive, or you know, maybe a, a reconsideration on the higher rates? Um, you know, if growth was shown through you know various ideas and actions taken by people. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Like, would we change our business model if we had if people came up with different ideas I, for I, how we could generate growth with a different business model or is that the question well, no potentially potentially this is aiming back at the the increased cash out fees would you consider an incentive that might reduce the cash out fees for certain creators if they came up with a second life growth plan that actually you know took footing and uh grew second life in some meaningful way uh I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if someone has an idea for how we should grow Second Life and you haven't told us about it, like, damn, what the hell? Like, tell us. We were all ears for any ideas that would help us grow Second Life because that's going to benefit all of us. And so please, please share those magic ideas for how this growth can happen. Um, and, you know, are there uh, certain growth uh, trajectories or scale at which the our revenue model could change in accordance with that. Of course, that could that's possible. Uh, maybe with more users, you, we could operate at a thinner margin and still make it a very very viable business. Um, and that would be great for everybody. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think. Smaller businesses probably have to have higher margins to to make it viable. And you know, Amazon has been has a business model of like <laughs> minuscule margin and make it up in volume. And so, you know, I'm 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 all cool with that too. Mm -hmm. um, but um, and then the, you know, which is which is kind of separate from. Uh, which part of the business do we collect money from and what types of users or what scenarios do we uh, get our revenues from uh, and making sure that's a good balance with what gives opportunities for creators because if opportunities are not there for creators then the content doesn't create get created and if there's no content created then this whole thing falls on its face so we, we have to make sure that we're in good balance between what works for us and what works for the community at large but yeah, right. first of all, please, if you have ideas for how we can grow or what you can do to accelerate growth, please let us know. Yep, well, certainly. Ask. And 
I was going to just dovetail onto that. And certainly if, if people do have ideas and stuff like that, I'm all ears. You know how to get a hold of me. Most of you do. Uh, and I listen to these ideas all the time. Go what ahead, I was going to what I was going to say is why not have a Linden Economics Prize and get residents to actually send in ideas in order to win a prize. Yeah, uh, I, I I know we have we have special sort of you know groups and forums or, or where we interact a lot of people with kind of maybe more technical productive things, but maybe maybe there is a, a, a a reason to talk more about have groups or, or uh, some sort of process where way we talk more about user acquisition, retention, economics uh, mm. in general. But uh, I have to make sure that the people here that spend energy on that would, would have time and energy to really engage with that in, in a more formal way. Um, it's a really complex topic. <laughs> so, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's something we've been doing for a long time. So, mm. uh, even people that want to contribute to that dialogue would have to invest a lot of time and energy uh, because just us having the same conversation with people over and over and over is not necessarily yes. best of our time either. So, yeah. Um, it's not something that I, 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 it'd be rare for someone to just have some magic ideas that we haven't heard or seen already on this topic. Mm. And if we engage with people, we might be spending a huge amount of our time just educating people on what has been tried and what worked, what doesn't work and why that could rather than actually, you know, moving forward. So it would be a fairly substantial commitment for anyone who wants to help push that forward. Uh, mm. So I'm just saying you, you you're signing up for something if you really want to help us out, not just throwing out ideas because we have a million of those. We've been through a lot of them as well. So uh, it's not it's not easy. You know? you know, if you want to help us there, you know, you can, <clears throat> you really roll up your sleeves. Yeah. Otherwise you would have done it if it was Yeah. Easy. And we probably have done it. <laughs> <laughs> so Yeah indeed. Yeah. Uh, so one more uh, kind of economy-related question. Um, you know, if Vic, Vic basically asks and says that if he understands correctly, you know, the, the cash-out fees are a path that we all go down together, right? Mm. Where, where do you think you see the final step? You know, is there some percentage ceiling, like 20 or 30 percent at some point someday? Um, and then, like, when you hit that ceiling, is land going to be, like, zero? Or, you know, what are your thoughts on what that future might look like? Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to go to zero for land. Um, and it's not like we're going to just flip it from one side to the other side of that equation. It's a matter of finding a balance. And I don't know when we believe we've achieved sort of optimum balance, and then, you know, it could be that, you know, if, if you reach a certain balance and also a, a, some meaningful changes in the cost basis of all this stuff, where you start looking at how can we lower prices overall, our, basically the Linden Lab margins on the business, because it actually generates growth and we, we make it up in volume what we don't, you know, get on margin. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really hard to predict. Um, I think we want to be very careful. I think we want to do it by step by step. And uh, it's we, we also want to try and keep it simple. I mean, we've discussed, you know, should there be fees uh, on transactions? My God, the different types of transactions. What about gifting? What about skill gaming? What about, you know, purchasing uh, certain types of content? Or what about services? And what about, like, you don't want to end up with something like, you know, the U.S. tax code here. That would be just <laughs> insane, right? So how do you keep it simple, understandable, 
to, to operate and understand, where also when you start having variations and flavors, that people find all kinds of ways to sort of get around it. And now you start mm -hmm. creating, scenting a lot of strange behavior. So uh, keeping it simple, uh, keeping it fair, um, you know, for I would say for some users, the, the business model we've had has been unfair for some users and really, really attractive for other users. And so how do we find the right balance where the value that people get out of the product is sort of the cost of that value is reasonably evenly distributed, I think is um, uh, something we're still moving towards because I think it's been out of whack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what that is. But, you know, so when I say that sort of digital goods transactions on planet Earth um, tend to be in the 30% and higher, you know, look what we have to pay um, distributors, distribution of digital uh, to Steam for Sansar, or what we have to pay Apple for distribution of our content on their platform, there's 30%, or lots of these types of digital marketplaces uh, they're varying rates. You have, what, 70% in some goes to the house, 30 in some other places. We're way below that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to stay below that because um, I think we add too much friction to this micro economy and transactions. It just potentially doesn't become worthwhile for people to invest their time and energy in creating this content and, and selling it and making it worth their time. So I think we have to be careful to not, you know, stop um, creativity and people being able to profit from their creativity. And so, but at the same time, we have to pay for all these people making the service better, for hosting all these servers and doing all the engineering we're doing and also make a profit. We're, you know, we're, we're not a non-profit. We are a profit, <laughs> for-profit company. So we have to find the right balance, what, how much we can make, how much you can make, and have it all go around. And ultimately find that sweet spot where people are incented to create content, people are incented to buy content, and uh, whatever that content is, whether it's a service or con you know, a shirt or a house or whatever it might be. So uh, uh, I think we're still looking for the ideal balance. And I think with this last step we took, we, we were, I think we're getting more balanced, but I'm not sure we're appropriately balanced yet. So we'll have to let this run for a while and see how it settles <clears throat> and learn from it and then decide next steps. From there, we have no specific next steps planned, um, but I would like to see land getting cheaper. And, and at what point do we lower price of land to the point where people start? We make it up in volume somehow, um, and th then it's like maybe it's better to sell land full region for a hundred bucks instead of two hundred and what is it now? Two hundred and forty-five bucks. Hmm. Um, because we would sell so much more of it, and that creates uh, economic stimulus for all the other things people do because they need to fill that land. You know, houses yes. and chairs and trees and more people. So then now they want to buy shirts and hair. And what is that perfect uh, model for, for growth? And uh, mm. so it's a combination of getting the right economic model and also a combination of ease of use and... and easy way for new users to uh, you know, join this world and, and be successful in this world. So continuous, continuous improvement and learnings and iteration go. I don't, I can't really speak to a max or min number of certain percentages and whatnot. There's a very lively discussion going on among the audience with a rather creative idea for raising money, which is that you should impose a tax on ban lines. 
May, may, I don't know what that would do for us. I'm sure we could do some math on how many band lines are there and how many people would be willing to pay for it. And maybe that's 50 bucks. I don't know. Maybe it's, <laughs> I, I, it doesn't smell like millions to me, but you know, we'll, <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's part of, you know, how we think about, you know, premium and what, what benefits should people get for free? What benefits should people have to pay for? Um, mm-hmm. and that's, that's, that's an interesting process as well. I, I, you know, I know we're, we're working on a new lineup of our premium offering and mm-hmm. what, what prices for what features and benefits do you get at the different levels, whatever you call them, bronze, silver, gold, whatever we decide, but finding that sweet spot so that people, um, get the value they think is worthwhile and that enough people convert to adopt certain premium levels. Uh, But I don't know if we want to have too many sort of random a la carte fees sprinkled about because that just adds complexity. Yes. Yes, indeed. Pudge, do you you have another question? We sure do. So, uh, this is kind of a, a fun one. I'm going to pair these up, one's from Anna and one's from Phoenix. You've been on record at previous SLBs stating that you don't have a bear. Have you fixed that yet? And do bear uh, requests <laughs> count as valid questions? <laughs> I do not. And I don't know what it will take. Way. After five years, I still haven't done it, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm hopeless uh, on, the, on the bear front. Uh, I don't know what incentives it would take for me to uh, make that happen. Maybe someone can think of an incentive that would make that happen. I don't know. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that one is still uh, a question mark. Well, we'll have to try to get you fixed up with that. Okay. Here's another one from Bath Tech. What would you recommend people study or do if they would like to work for Linden Lab? Ooh. Wow. Well, first of all, I recommend you study and do what, what you're passionate about. Um, I think that's probably the most ideal path forward for anybody. Um, well, we do a lot of different things here, uh, from, you know, Patch's team has customer service to help people, their, uh, issues and make them, help them become successful. Uh, he has a large group of people that work on, you know, with moles and others to create, you know, from linen homes to, to landing spots, to welcome areas, to social islands, and all kinds of in between. So it's kind of a, you know, it's helped. Well, first of all, a lot of Lindens used to be residents. So being very passionate about Second Life, understanding Second Life, and how to be successful in Second Life, obviously has converted a, a number of residents to, to full-time Lindens. So it certainly doesn't uh, hurt you to uh, be uh, a very strong and successful uh, somebody uh, in, in the context of Second Life. Um, but yeah, if you want to be an engineer, you got to know got to know your coding. Um, so there's there's product managers, marketing managers, uh, engineers, QA, quality assurance, custom service, custom, you know. So it's it's kind of software company type of stuff. Uh, we're a software company, and uh, like most software companies, they require all that types of skills. And so, if you have passion for Second Life, you're successful in Second Life, you uh, are a positive and optimistic person, and you have skills in in those kinds of areas. And we happen to have job openings; we we post them, so keep an eye on those. Then. You know, apply and uh, best of luck. You certainly, <clears throat> someone just asked in chat, do we have to live in Seattle or San Francisco to be a Linton or a Mole? And the answer is, I can say no. That's right. Second Life team is very distributed. Um, we are obviously working on a product that is virtual and it doesn't have, you know, physical geography and we use Second Life and a lot of other tools to be a very highly distributed and highly effective team. We have people all over the US. 
Uh, we have very, very, very few, and only in special cases, uh, people outside the U.S. So if you're outside the U.S., it's, chances are fairly slim because it just creates a lot of extra HR and complexities to deal with other jurisdictions. Uh, even some states in the U.S. are more complicated than other states. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have uh, an easy way of having full-time people in, in all states in the U.S. But uh, no, uh, some roles uh, might be more dependent on specific geographies, uh, but most uh, actually do not. So we have offices mm -hmm. in Boston, Seattle, San Francisco, Virginia, um, where we have you know decent-sized clusters of, of employees in offices, but uh, Second Life people are or in Atlanta as well, where Patch is. Mm. Um, yep, we just talked but, about that on Monday, in fact. Yeah, mm. so there, there's, there are, we're geographically distributed both with our offices and then a lot of people working from what we call the Moon Lab, which is wherever you are. We have us, right. in, you know, in New Hampshire, and we have, uh, we have, you know, Brett up in in Washington and. So we're in all corners of, you know, we're Boston, Washington, California, Florida, Atlanta. We're, yeah, we're all over the place. And we don't mind that at all. We, we're so used to working in a distributed fashion. We just hired another QA person. He just accepted our offer today, and he's out of Florida. Works for us. Land of the Mouse. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that applies to the lab people, but the moles come from right across the world, don't they? Yes, they do. We have a little yeah, more that's... flexibility with the moles because they're yeah. freelance contractors. Yeah, mm -hmm. not full-time. Yeah. Different HR requirements. Yep. Ready for another? Yeah. I've got a Thank I've you. got a good one from uh, from somebody that I actually work with very closely, Stingray Raymaker, um, with the American Cancer Society. Uh, Thank you for all you do to support us and other nonprofit missions in the virtual world. Sometimes we get questions about whether the dollars raised through our events are reaching the American Cancer Society. We do as much as we can to educate our volunteers and supporters of the process. Have you given any thought? Uh, to how Linden Lab might be able to publicly legitimize the verified nonprofit organizations and events in Second Life. Wow. I mean, uh, I w would love to do whatever we can to help in that area. I think Brett would be the right person to figure out how to communicate that le legitimization <laughs> uh, that you're asking for. I mean, I've always thought it as, as a legit. So if it, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like there's people that suspect that it's not legit, or is it just awareness uh, he's asking for? So, but obviously we are uh, very, very excited and motivated to support uh, fundraising uh, and nonprofits, you know, from from special pricing, from special support, from special marketing help we can do to uh, give success to these organizations and people that manage to bring so much uh, positive good to the world. So I don't know exactly what we can do more, but uh, Brett would be a perfect person to talk to about how and what else we could possibly do to make uh, these organizations even more successful because they're awesome. Yes, indeed. All right. Ready for more? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, got a question here from Evangeline. Uh, where do you imagine or would like to see SL in 10 years time with technological advances or other factors. And there's kind of a part two to this. And how is Linden Lab planning to keep Second Life moving with the times technologically so that the world continues to attract new generations of users in the future who may have different expectations to those in world currently? Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's a race. Um, and 
you know, maybe Sansar comes up later in this conversation about how we, you know, we're also taking a stab at a completely different, you know, start from scratch approach to tackle some of the things that are new in the world, like virtual reality hardware and stuff like that, that would be, mm -hmm. some of those things would be an extreme challenge for Second Life of how it was designed and what it's, where its value sits for the users and try and shoehorn that into some new technologies uh, could be just be like, just doesn't fit. Um, so, uh, but we're always investing and it's, it's, a, it's a huge product with like so many features and functionality. I sometimes, I'm at, at in awe over how many products we are within this world, you know, where, where we're a bit of PayPal, we're a bit of Blender, we're a bit of uh, Unity, we're a bit of, uh, you know, messaging products, we're a bit of, uh, you know, so all these systems make it like, we're not necessarily the absolute best in any one of those. You could argue Unity is a better engine, you could argue that PayPal is a better way to move money around the world, you can argue, but it's the combination of these things that make it a fully functional virtual world and kind of need all of these pieces to, to make a fully functional world. So it's, it's difficult to sort of be best in everything. And so I think it's what we're trying to be is the best of combination. Of um, but we're, we're obviously investing uh, a lot. Um, the, the, you know, just as an example, this whole effort to move our whole backend infrastructure from our own proprietary uh, hosting in, in a facility with our own hardware, with our own custom systems, all moving all of that over to uh, the Amazon cloud is a huge undertaking. And we're not just doing that because we have to, we're doing that because we wanna be able to offer better services uh, with more scale, with more performance, uh, you know, all kinds of new interesting possibilities down the road. Um, and so we're investing heavily for, for the long term um, in, in Second Life. And the cloud work we're doing is just one of those. I'm sure over the last couple of days, you've also heard from Awesome Patch and about other cool things coming down the pipe in, in making it uh, a, a more attractive product, whether it's the work we're doing with avatars and bakes on mesh and EEP and all these projects. So there's constant juggling of, of uh, you know, inserting new capabilities and new features. Ultimately also, you know, what about other platforms? People expect uh, things like Second Life to be on mobile devices. So we're starting, you know, with with a mobile companion type uh, second line, so that you can be connected to your community uh, while on the go with your phone or, or iPad or whatever you have. And so, so that work is underway. Uh, it's not going to necessarily be, uh, you know, a full 3D world on your phone, but at least you can stay connected with your groups and, and shopping and managing a business. I'm not sure exactly what features we'll have in the first version, but so that you can sort of be in the world on your PC or your Mac. And then at least when you're away with your phone, you can still be connected to the world and the community uh, and your friends and, uh, or customers. Um, and, uh, so, and over time, at some point, uh, you know, streaming solutions that we've had before so that you can get the full fidelity of Second Life mobile devices will make sense. We've experimented with that through partnerships in the past. And, you know, once the pricing model of cloud GPUs come down, it, it'll make it easier because it's not easy to sort of, you know, render the complexity of Second Life with the sort of size of concurrency that we support uh, on mm -hmm. Shoving that into a phone and the horsepower you have in phone is, is kind of a super daunting task. So we have to rely on cloud GPUs for that. It's just that they've been extremely expensive and, you know, we, we could offer that as a subscription product, but we haven't decided to go there yet because there's still, you know, thankfully there's lots of good competition between Google and Microsoft and Amazon on, on that front. So that 
we'll be able to get to a point where that makes sense to offer that type of a product. Um, and so, yeah, how, how how much better can the world work? How much faster can the world work? So constantly working on performance, uh, ease of use. Uh, there, there's so many areas to tackle to make it a more broadly appealing product uh, than it is today. We're tackling it from lots of fronts all at once. So if any, again, if anyone have ideas for what we can do to be more attractive to a different type of audience or a broad audience, we're for all ears. I just had kind of a timely question come in uh, that kind of segues into this pretty well. Um, you know, have we thought about using Steam again or approaching Steam again for Second Life? So it's a challenge. Um, Steam wants 30%. Are you willing to give up 30% of what you make to pay them? Does it come from us? Does it come from you? How, how do we take 30% of the pie and give it to them? That's, that's, that's what it costs. So 30% of what? Hmm. You know, if it's a retail product that sells for 30 bucks, fine. They get their 10 bucks and the publisher gets 20 bucks and there you go. Hmm. Well, we're free to play with an in-world economy and what piece of that in-world economy they want. And so we've created a business model that is not necessarily easy to just add another taker of the economy to the tune of 30%. That, that, mm -hmm. that would be a challenge. And, you know, some of these distribution partners, whether it's Steam or other upcoming distribution partners, um, they sometimes have issues with subject matter, they sometimes have issues with our economic model because we allow you to make money. Mm. Um, I mean, you should know we've invested a huge amount of effort to, in a compliant way, enable you to cash out the kind of money you're cashing out. Last year, you all cashed out $64 million. So we're basically a money transmitter because some of you take money, put money in the system and give it to someone else and they cash it out. That is a transmission mm -hmm. of money. And there's a huge amount of compliance and, and legal wrangling that has to be done. And we've now have money transmitter licensed in every state in the U.S. And that's a really arduous, long, hard process to have all the KYC and AML and OFAC and all these processes that it takes to be a, a legal money transmitter. And even if we, even though we have all of these licenses and we're fully legit in how we do this, some of these distribution partners still get heartburn over this because they try and figure out what liability are they taking on with mm -hmm. how money moves between users. And sometimes they think it's anti-competitive with it. So it's never an easy thing to just say, oh, let's just put it on Steam because it, it mm -hmm. severely changes potentially product offering and the business model that you can have. And some of those things are quite set in Second Life. So if you guys thought, you know, tweaking the the cash out rate was was kind of a uh, extreme, then, you know, if you want to distribute on Steam, then, you know, some much more extreme things would have to happen. So mm -hmm. it's currently not in our plans. Okay, Patch, I think we've got time for maybe one, two more questions. Yeah, maybe one to two more. Uh, I've got my, maybe one that's a little longer. Um, Skylar asks, or says, uh, since Second Life has been around since 1999, basically, uh, many virtual worlds, such as there.com, have struggled to stay alive, especially after the Depression of 2008. What made Second Life stay afloat and still able to earn revenue, as well as, as, well as you know, to be able to continue to grow? And also, what suggestions do you have for other virtual world starters or current virtual worlds to be able to achieve the success that Second Life is at? Oh, don't tell them. Don't tell them. Like I'm supposed <laughs> to give away the secret sauce? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's a bit of magic. Um, it's, it's kind of – sometimes it's timing and a combination of, of – magic ingredients that make it all work and um, it's not easy to just do get that magic but better uh, because sometimes if you try and make it better you make it different and that removes some of the magic mm -hmm. um, I think it's a combination of 
timing and magic and, and uh, the degree of freedom that we have allowed or enabled, uh, that's, you know, probably, I think, for a lot of companies, quite uncomfortable. Um, and companies tend to, for various reasons, to reduce risk or reduce exposure or reduce legal issues or legal, whatever, tend to want to have more control. And I think we've, we've been brave enough over the years to allow for a lot of, you know, us not having excessive control over what you can all do. Um, so that sort of level of freedom, I think, is unique. Um, and then there's some unique combination of freedom of expression, the economy, um, social. Um, and I'm not sure that it would be as easy to do. Actually, I mean, I'm pretty certain. Also, when Second Life came about and when it got traction, there were fewer alternatives uh, on the market. Today, it's very, very crowded for ways for entertain themselves on their PCs and have social experiences. Whether it's Minecraft or Roblox or Fortnite or all these things that people do. So it's a much more crowded field today. And that was even Second Life invented in a lot of interesting ways. You know, social, I mean, you didn't have Facebook back then. You didn't have, you know, so it was early and brave. Uh, so we got to thank Philip and, and a bunch of people who are here early on. Some are still here um, for making some really ballsy, tough decisions back then that um, were not necessarily comfortable or, or easy, but made it work. Uh, that's that's it's extremely unique and magical in that way. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to sort of carry that on and 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 grow it, uh, even though it's. I would say more difficult today than it was back then. Uh, it's easier mm. technically today, but it's way more crowded and people just have so many more options for what to do uh, every day in their lives um, that it's, it's, it's harder to cut through today. I was thinking that um, a big competitor that you haven't kind of mentioned is phones. Um, because back, back in the day, uh, there weren't cell phones. There were, you know, basically just mobile phones. And now, of course, people will spend hours. I was reading something today that people spend three hours a day playing Candy Crush, of all things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if, well, may, maybe some of these things have made us dumber and we're willing to spend more time doing useless things like Candy Crush, mm. uh, <clears throat> my opinion. Um, but, you know, I think it's, I'm hopeful that there's still the same number of people out there that want something more meaningful than that. Uh, but I think people have less tolerance today for investing their time to get what they want. So there's maybe that uh, people's attention span or how much time they're willing to spend to get something of value has constantly been reduced so that the expectation is I click on the button and I get what I want and if I don't, I'm out. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that could be part of mobile and just part of also that competition just has managed to create a lot of whether it's direct competition or completely indirect competition, uh, but just ultimately someone chooses to spend their time somewhere doing something. And uh, there's there's a lot of easy ways to get satisfaction today. You know, there's a lot of ways to satisfy yourself, whether it's for entertainment or economically or whatever. So mm -hmm. Just more crowded in that sense. Uh, but uh, so we have to continue to push to try and make it easier and uh, more understandable, uh, and at the same time, not dumb it down because it's it's this incredible diversity uh, that makes it interesting, but it's also what makes it complicated, and and so that I think that's a fascinating balancing act that you know, mm. uh, we could make it a lot simpler 
you know, Minecraft is a lot simpler. The diversity is, is nowhere near what we have in Second Life. Mm. And the freedom expression is, is sort of constrained in, a, in, a, in, in sort of an interesting way. But, but that ease of use created, you know, a ginormous, uh, pop, extremely popular product. So we're in that scale of complex freedom, create anything versus, no, you can only do these kinds of things, but it's a lot easier. Where on that spectrum do you want to be? And mm. uh, I think if we reduced what you can do in Second Life, which would make the product simpler, you know, that, that would probably upset a lot of current residents because part of that complexity is what makes it work for them. I think that's an interesting challenge. Like, what what things can be removed from second? Seem it less daunting and complicated, and still have it, you know, work for people that depend on those things. But maybe that's a good trade-off. Make the product simpler, and uh, you know, it'll upset some existing users because they depend on some of those things. But maybe it makes it the whole thing more approachable for you know, the average user trying to get involved. With so. Interesting, interesting problems to know. I'm going to ask one very quick last question. Um, have you, how much have you seen of the birthday so far? And are you planning to go around it a bit? I, I, I bust around uh, the last couple of days. Uh, went for a ride in, in some pods and looked at some of the art and uh, hopped in on some live music performance and danced around with some people. So yeah, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it uh, a bit here and there. My, my day is very, very sprinkled. So I, I, I don't get much time, but I do, I do, uh, I did buzz around and it's, it's awesome to see so many green dots and uh, uh, also just heard so many positive things uh, from what, what we've done there together. And so um, I'm just, I think it's just amazing. 16 years and yeah. can't look for, I mean, I'm excited for the next 16 and let's just keep it going. Me too. And I think that's a great note to finish on. So, uh, oh, I'll look out for the roller skating, Katie. That sounds like fun. Oh, roller skating. I'm going to have to check that out. <clears throat> yeah. You so, can get a hat. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks for your questions. Um, keep the questions coming. Keep being engaged. Keep pushing us to do better. And we'll keep pushing to make it better. And uh, thank you all. And, uh, have a wonderful day, evening, night, wherever you are. And look forward to talking and seeing you all soon again.